All right, episode six of Unearthing Cincinnati's Past with Greg Hand. Uh, thank you for coming on again, Greg. I hear that we have UFOs to talk about this week. Absolutely. Flying in from the eighth dimension. Very good. Very good. All right. What do we got? Okay. So, um, you know, people kind of think of unidentified flying objects as being sort of a modern modern thing. But even, even in Cincinnati, um, UFOs were found um, quite a ways back. The, there's there's a, a very uh, particular incident in 1898, uh, yeah. the story that appeared in the Enquirer, what was it? And what this describes is a situation in Lockland, Ohio. A bunch of uh, men were standing on the street corner waiting for the streetcar to come by yeah. Uh, to take them to work down in the city. And at 6 a.m. on a uh, morning in 1898, they see this object come flying out of the sky. And it's swooping around and circling the area. Uh, it was kind of misty that morning. So uh, they couldn't describe it much more precisely than it was being egg shaped. But they, noted that no matter where it swooped or swung around in the sky, this white shape that was kind of glowing had two red lights on the sides mm. um, that were flying around. So it sounds very much like an airplane. The yeah. thing is, this is five years before the Wright brothers uh, did their first wow. flight at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. And the description of the motion it was impossible for this to be a balloon right um you know they did have balloon flights at that time but they're talking about something moving at a fair rate of speed and the sort of maneuvers that it engaged in couldn't possibly have been uh from a balloon wow so, so in the 1800s we have our our first newspaper official ufo yeah. for cincinnati Right. And so oh, the um, Wright brothers. Wow. OK. Yeah. So so they're rare. They're rare. Yeah. But you, you do find mentions like this in the newspapers. Now, the floodgates for Cincinnati and for the rest of the country really came in 1947. That was when uh, the first reports describing these things is flying saucers. You know, that's that's a term that was not used before um, 1947, unless you were talking about a domestic quarrel where somebody is throwing crockery at you. But in 1947, even in Cincinnati, and here's here's the Cincinnati Enquirer, flying saucers over Cincinnati. It sounds like a movie, doesn't it? Yeah. And and this is in July of 1947. Um, the the uh, the object that made the front page of the Enquirer was a housewife in Terrace Park mm -hmm. who saw these objects, and uh, her name was Betty Stolmayer, and Betty Stolmayer sees these objects and reports them, and she in fact describes them as shiny silver plates that kind of look like a couple of phonograph records. Mm -hmm. uh, stacked together um, with uh, uh, brilliant reflected light and no sound of pr propulsion as this thing sailed through Ooh. the sky, right? Yeah, sounds pretty UFO-y to me. So, uh, yeah, you've got these unidentified things in the sky. And since they're in the sky, you know, the, the people in charge of the sky <laughs> are the Air Force. Yeah, and, and so, so many questions came out, you know, what are these things? And so people went to the FBI, and they went to the president and that sort of thing. And, and uh, the FBI didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so, uh, so the Air Force created uh, an investigative group called Project SIGN, S-I-G-N. Nice. And 
from 1947 until 1949, Project Sign collected reports of UFOs and, and then, then went out of business. Um, they, they claim to have issued a report. Nobody seems to be able to find this report, mm -hmm. but there are people uh, who were alive not too long ago who saw this report or at least claim to see this report and they're consistent in their description of this report that they say it definitely said we have no idea what these things are and it is highly likely they are of extraterrestrial origin. Uh -oh. Now if that is in fact the the case uh, it's the only example I know where the federal government has managed to totally cover something up. You know, the federal government has a really lousy history uh, mm -hmm. of trying to cover things up. And of course, they I always do and failing. Out. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this one, although people claim to have seen the report, although they claim to have seen the conclusion, it's gone. Wow. So the Air Force uh, then started a commission called Project Grudge. And just the name of it suggests that they were in kind of a bad mood. <laughs> yeah, about, about this, they're not really hiding their true yeah. feelings about that one, right? And so, for a couple of years, Project Grudge uh, collected again information about these these sightings, and they issued a report in 1951 that essentially said, uh, "You people are bothering us." Uh, you haven't seen anything other than swamp gas or weather balloons and just shut up and go away uh, was, was kind of the, the, or the, we'll essence, the grudge. <laughs> yeah. The essence of the project grudge report. Now, unfortunately, 1951 happened to be one of those years where there were thousands of UFO sightings, mm -hmm. project grudge holding this report saying, you know, go, go away. Nothing to and see so, here. Yeah. Nothing to see go here. Home. Move on, move on. <laughs> and so the, uh, air force decided, okay, let's, let's give it a third try mm -hmm. and see what's going to go on. And so they created something called project blue book. Okay. And, and project have, blue book. all there. Yeah. No, this, this is one of their reports. One of the special reports. Yeah, they, of 14. Yeah, they, this, this is, uh, this is a 1955 reported special report number 14. Nice. Okay. Okay. And so the, the, uh, the, the Air Force started Project Blue Book, and it ran for 18 years, ran from 1952 to 1970. Okay. And it was based right up the road in um, – Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Nice. Is, is where it was located. Now, there's a very unusual thing about Project Blue Book is it, it, it it's very clearly an Air Force project. The Air Force started it, mm -hmm. and it's on an Air Force base. And, uh, you know, the Air Force is collecting uh, information. But as the information came in, it, it would be filled out in a particular format. And so there's this record card mm -hmm. and it says project 173 or uh, 10073. So um, that happens to be a CIA classification sequence. Okay. So even though this is an Air Force project, and even though Air Force personnel is conducting this investigation, they are entering their data on a form that is used by the CIA. Used by the CIA. Okay. Right. Okay. So that adds an air of mystery to this. Yeah. So again, you know, for 18 years, uh, if you saw something and contacted the Air Force or whatever, they would send you a form you'd fill out the form and you'd put it in the mail and it would go to Dayton, Ohio, where they managed to collect in an 18 year period, more than 12,600 UFO sightings. Wow. Okay. Wow, so it's, okay. It's not quite a thousand a year, 
but it's 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 pretty close. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's not nothing. And so uh, these reports stacked up in Dayton, Ohio, uh, for many years, and each one that came in was uh, classified. Mm-hmm. So so uh, you you filled the thing out, you sent it off, and they rarely got back to you. Yeah. Uh, with with any details, they would get back to you usually with a conclusion of one sort or another. You know, like uh, we think you saw the planet Venus, or <laughs> we think you saw a commercial aircraft, or 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 they'll they'll even say, you know, w- we have insufficient data to, yeah. to make a conclusion. But but the actual report itself was classified. Well, eventually, uh, they needed space in Dayton. And so they brought a truck up and they packed up all of these files, all 12,600 some odd reports. And they sent them to an Air Force storage unit in Alabama. Mm-hmm. And they sat there for um, 30 or 40 years. And finally, somebody said, you know, there's no sense keeping these things classified. Everybody's asking about them. And, you know, let's, let's just declassify them. So they did. Now, in declassifying, <laughs> yeah, in declassifying them, it, it was a, a, an enormous job because what they um, what they did was redact the reports. So ah. somebody went through them, and any information that would lead to a, a, a precise individual, they blacked out. Mm. And so. Um, you you can find out the city, for instance, that a lot of these reports came from, uh, but very rarely will you find the actual address. Yeah. Uh, you you never find a specific name. But when they were redacted and declassified yeah. and, and made public, the Internet Archive got involved and they scanned all of them. And so all 12,600 reports from Project Blue Book are now available at archive.org. Wow, okay. The Internet Archive. Yeah. And you, you can look up UFOs and, and get into this particular archive. And then you can search for locations. And that's what I did. I tried to find as many uh, examples Cincinnati area yeah. of, of UFOs from Cincinnati that, that I could. And the, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting that, uh, they run the gamut. You know, there, there are some reports from Cincinnati where you can, you can almost hear, uh, the air force brass chuckling <laughs> up in Dayton. He's writing it down, <laughs> you know, like, Oh my God. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Are, are, are you kidding me? And then there are others where, they they are stumbling all over themselves trying to find an explanation that does not involve little green men. So yeah. so the reports from Cincinnati cover that that whole spectrum. You know, an example of of uh, the the former, and and they they have a numbering sequence. So the reports are numbered, and they have the year and the yeah. month, and then they have then they have a code uh, number. And so this particular one is 1959-10. So it's from October of 1959. And then it's got 69596370. And it is a report from um, Deer Park, Ohio, where an observer claims to have seen a cigar-shaped object with fuzzy or blurred edges possibly 150 feet long, uh, made of metal, uh, no sound okay. um, as it went by. And the um, Air Force report on it says, uh, there's insufficient information to form a valid conclusion. Subsequent reports from the same witness indicates that he reports any object or light in the sky with his own interpretation that they are flying saucers. There is also the strong probability that some of these reports are imaginary. Okay. It turns out that this is a, 
this is a 13 year old at the time, 13 year old kid in Deer Park, Ohio, who every night he went outside and saw something and called the Air Force and got a report to fill out and all of his his reports kind of- I wonder, so he was, he was 13 and 59? Yeah. So I wonder uh, uh, if you are listening to this podcast, whoever you That's are, because right. your name was redacted, <laughs> Feel free to contact free. me. We will have you on as a guest star. Let's see. They'd be uh, they'd be tell like us your actual story. Seventy five now. Yeah. Right? Tell yeah. us. Tell us what you saw. Um, there's there's another report, and this one's from 1957. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, this is a guy from Mount Healthy, and the um, <laughs> he calls the Air Force. They send him a form. He fills out the form, mm -hmm. and he says that he he and eight other observers, so he's got co-witnesses. Oh, yeah, they got an ass in accord. Uh, saw two bright blue lights trailed by, by a bright red light, mm -hmm. and that's about it. Because, um, as the Air Force says, with the exception of a statement that he saw a UFO, he can give us nothing or remembers nothing on the size, shape, elevation, direction, and other basic data generally remembered or given by UFO observers. Also, what little information he has contradicts itself. So they couldn't ah. even get eight people together. And then the, 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 the icing on the cake is there's a place on the form where you can draw what you saw <laughs> oh, and, God. It moves. and there's his drawing. It's a line? It's a line. Now, <laughs> this is his drawing. This over here is the Air Force note, which says, is this it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's an easy explanation for this. And that is that the alien, the aliens then scrambled these, these eight people's it. minds. <laughs> <laughs> you saw a line in the sky. That was it. And he he must have filled out the form with a crayon or yeah. or, or or something. Wow. The, um, but then on the other hand, <laughs> you get you get some that are relatively difficult mm -hmm. to uh, to dismiss. So like. Um, uh, a, a guy who can't fill out the form, you can you can kind of dismiss that. Thirteen year old kid who files a report every other week, right. you can kind of dismiss that. But when a Catholic priest mm. turns in a report, you got to kind of take it seriously, you know. And so, 1966, April of 1966, uh, we have the report of a Catholic priest who was on the faculty at Roger Bacon High School. Okay, and so. So he goes to, uh, he's, he's on his way to school and, and he gets there um, just at sunrise and reports that in the West, there was a very bright orange object which appeared to hover 2,000 to 3,000 feet above the ground. It had the shape of a pancake, but thicker in the center with a definite bulge on the top side. So. Basically, he's describing a classic movie UFO flying saucer. Flying saucer, right? Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, I thought it was an airplane at first, banking and catching the early rays of, of the sun. Many things went through my mind, but especially the fact that the sun had not risen enough to reflect light off the object. Therefore, the object must have been its own light source Ooh. and he includes his drawing which which shows him the observer right here yeah and a bunch of trees and then this flying saucer hovering on the the other side of the trees wow now what he did what he did is what a lot of of these observers do is that he gave the air force um the ammunition it needed to shoot him down uh -oh. so by saying naturally i thought it was a plane at first the um air force in their report said first of all they they classify it as insufficient data so they're they're mm -hmm. leaving the door open 
I mean, it was a better drawing. You can't say that it was an insufficient drawing because it was more than a line. So, uh, but they said uh, that they believe that what he saw was in fact an airplane. Right. But I mean, you can't dismiss it from that. Like if if the only thing that you've seen fly at that altitude is a plane, then of course your mind's going to go, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's an airplane. No, wait a second. It doesn't look like or move like or sound like an airplane. Yeah, but the uh, you you it's kind of a pattern. You you mm-hmm. will find somebody say something like, "Oh, my neighbor said it was a meteor," you know, uh, and and then follow that with, "I explained to him that this couldn't possibly have been a meteor." Blah 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 blah. And when the report comes back, and the government says, "It says, oh, by the way, we think it's a meteor." Yeah, that was definitely a meteor. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's that the kind response. Of thing. <laughs> and so, uh, in fact, there, there, there was a case like that. This is from 1953, uh, June of 1953. Okay. And this one, they messed up on the redacting. They, um, they, 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 they missed they a word or something? They, they, they left in the fact that it, it was Cincinnati, uh, but they forgot to cross out the name the address you know oh. the, the name is removed but the address is there and so you can look up the property records and discover that um, during this time period uh, the house at that address was owned by uh, actually an aeronautical engineer at uh, General Electric and his oh, wow. wife uh, so they were sitting on their house uh, porch at um, 3308 Cavanaugh. This is off of McHenry uh, in, in the Westwood area. Okay. And uh, Russell Phillips and his wife, Hester, uh, were sitting there on the porch. And they saw um, this amazing object come in. It... Um, It was very bright. It was speeding from the north to the south, Mm -hmm. pulsing from yellow to orange. It made a wide angled turn in front of the moon. So there was a a full moon that night. It went in front of the moon. And as it passed in front of the moon, they could see a dark ring encircling it. Oh, so quite a detailed description of yeah. this thing. So he calls the That's Air Force. Great. They send a copy of the standard form and and he fills it back. Now, uh, he notes that the local newspaper had reported a meteor exploding over the city that night. And he says, but I'm an aeronautical engineer. I'm quite familiar with what's visible in the sky. Mm -hmm. I know what a meteor looks like. This thing is not a meteor. It passed in front of the sun, uh, in front of the moon. And I I could see the shape of it and I could see this dark ring around it, you know? So I know it wasn't, wasn't a meteor. Um, His wife uh, was absolutely convinced this was an interplanetary space, spacecraft. (laughs) And he puts in his note with with some scientific knowledge. I have no idea what it could possibly be, but I enjoy the idea that it could be interplanetary. Yeah. And so the uh, the conclusion of the Air Force was uh, that it was a meteor. <laughs> That's not. Well, yeah. How, how's a meteor going to come down? Right. Take a left turn, a right turn, go in front of the moon. Go in front of the moon. Wow. The, did the, the did the wife file a different report or just kind of add it on to his? No, no, he he did he did the the whole report the on whole report. One. Yeah. But it's it's you know, it's very interesting that the reports that either make a good case mm-hmm. or uh that have insufficient data in Cincinnati quite often those reports were made by people who work in the aeronautics industry in some form or another. I've got one coming up where it's a, 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 a licensed pilot mm-hmm. uh, who's, who's, who's talking about, about his report. 
Yeah, who, fact, would, who would know the difference between a plane or yeah, <laughs> something sort of else thing. that is up in the sky? Right. So uh, let's see, 1967 September. September we have uh, we have a report. This is uh, this is from Pleasant Ridge. Okay. Pleasant Ridge, um, and uh, uh, this again is is a, a young person. He's 11 years old. And he sends in a stack of Polaroid photographs. Oh. And they all pretty much look like this. There's a tree and a tree and two utility poles. Yeah, but he got uh, got something up there. He's got got something right there. And so he sends them in, and the the Air Force sends him a form. And apparently he never filled out the form. Mm. So uh, the Air Force didn't get back to him, but it did file the photographs. And it says um, uh, insufficient data, uh, which is about the highest praise you can get from the Air Force. But there's a <laughs> handwritten note that says photos are very similar to a Frisbee. <laughs> so what? You know, there, there, there you go. So he, this is, he threw the Frisbee up and yeah. then tried to take a picture real quick. Yeah, that, that sort of thing. And Genius. What a genius and, little 11-year-old. The, 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 the interesting thing is they're, they're Polaroid photos, mm -hmm. so they're unique. You know, you, you don't have a negative right. that you can make multiple prints with a Polaroid. Um, and there are four or five of them, and they look identical. So, <laughs> so if... If even if he had an accomplice throwing a frisbee, and and was trying to catch it, couldn't be in the same spot every time. They're in the exact same spot yeah. every time. So so the the inclination I would have is that something was actually hovering there. Mm -hmm. Now, sure, it's uh, you know possible to have a fishing line holding it there or something right. like that, but. But uh, very hard to dismiss it as a flying frisbee, you know. But the government, or but the Air Force did. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's this this uh, licensed pilot that I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, he and his wife were uh, were driving through what at the time was a fairly rural area um, on the hills above Cleves. Um, okay. This is in um, 1966. And, and he sees this object. It's egg-shaped. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is he believes that this egg is about 120 feet tall and about 60 feet across, so fairly substantial yeah. in size. What's interesting is that it changed shape. It went from a totally flat line to an egg, back to a totally flat line to an egg. Mm. Now it's possible that there's something rotating. It's possible that there's something else at work. But the observer here is is a guy that that flies airplanes, and and he mentions that he's he's instrument qualified. So he's used to flying at night. He's used to flying in bad weather. Yeah. He's used to determining what's what's out there uh in the in the sky and so the air force gets this report and again insufficient data mm. uh, to make a determination but what's cool about these declassified things is you'll have a typewritten note that says insufficient data but then on top of it somebody will handwrite something and say uh find, find out if it's a weather balloon Okay. Something like that. And yeah. then there'll be a follow-up note. And there was in this case, somebody wrote on it and said, you know, okay, okay you know, see if we can figure out what it was. Yeah. Dismiss this as a weather balloon. And somebody says, I, I called uh, the weather centers all around that area. And nobody hit a balloon up that night. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, but still, insufficient data yeah you can't just slap an insufficient data on that right. we need to get to the bottom of the story so one of my favorites was um a guy now this 
this uh, this would have taken place about about a mile as the crow flies from where I'm sitting right now. 1969. This guy over okay. near nice. the uh, Gamble Nippert YMCA mm -hmm. in in Westwood. Uh, it was um, around uh, nine o'clock at night. And he's looking south, and he saw what he described as a toy top with three lights. Okay. And it was moving back and forth and remained visible for almost half an hour. Um, he did a drawing of it. Here's the drawing. It's the lights. Kind of a triangular yeah. shaped thing. And he indicates where there are lights. That's a 3D Dorito. Right. And the, the thing that is amazing about this is um, if you are going to fake something, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to use a Frisbee. You're going to yeah. use a hubcap. You're, you're going to use something that looks like a flying saucer because that's what people expected to see was a flying saucer. Right. The thing is, in actual reports, this particular shape is maybe the fourth or fifth most common scene really? and reported in UFO reports. There are quite a number of delta-shaped, triangular-shaped, triangular, -shaped, triangular uh, the pyramidal yeah. objects, all with lights in this exact arrangement. And it's the kind of thing where if you're going to fake it, why pick something that no, you have to explain to somebody, right? You know, instead of something where they would they would just go, oh, that 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 looks like a UFO. And so, here's mm. the weird thing about this one. He calls the Air Force. He makes the report. They send him a form, and the form says it says on the cover sheet, observer re requested to complete the Air Force Form 117, but failed to do so. And that cover note saying he didn't fill out the form is stapled to his completed form. That's, 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 that's government work for you, right? Okay. <laughs> wow. So, so I have no idea about, about what that's all about. Yeah. But that's interesting that we, we, even in Cincinnati area, we got the different, Different shapes, different. Yeah, we got the actual like flying saucer. You got we egg got shaped. The, uh, yeah, I got the egg shaped. Got right. the three D Dorito with lights. Got yeah. uh, orange, big glowing orange. Glowing ball. The sun. Those are all Absolutely. different. Yeah, we definitely have uh, have aliens that are interested in the Cincinnati area here. I have a friend who is um, like deathly afraid of aliens. He won't watch like what is it the fourth oh, okay. time. Or yeah. any other like scary alien movie with me. Um, shout out Jimmy. But he uh, hopefully there's not a lot going on in Springboro. But it's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty close to Dayton. So I mean, if there's a lot going on up there, oh my goodness, yeah, the, he might be in the in the thick of the uh, the aliens coming down to check on us from from <laughs> in, in Ohio up there. So here's here's one that I I really love. This is from 1963. Okay. And, and they included some photos. You don't actually see anything. What you're seeing is a group of people and a field yeah. and some trees. And what they saw hovering, as they describe it, ab above, above these trees was, um, was a, 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 a craft of some sort with light mm -hmm. and uh, these people, it, it was basically a man and his three children returning from a baseball game. They, they lived in Maysville, Kentucky. They'd been up in Cincinnati watching the Reds, drive back to, um, to Maysville, Kentucky, park the car, get out, and there's this thing hovering over the field down the road from their house. And they, they, yeah. they, they're quite uh, insistent on this description that it wasn't moving, that it was hovering. And it stayed there for an extended period of time. And then it uh, kind of flipped sideways and sped off. Mm, that okay. sounds pretty UFO-y, yeah. Yeah, so the Air Force 
comes back and they say that um, they believe it is a conventional military aircraft. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about that theory. It was top secret at the time, but Cincinnati was in the middle of a bullseye where the Air Force practiced nuclear war in the 1960s. Okay. There are a number of Air Force bases in the Southeast of the United States and in the Northwest of the United States. There are a number of Air Force bases in the Southwest and in the Northeast. And the uh, flight path to take airplanes from one of these air bases to another crosses directly over Cincinnati. Mm. And in the 1960s, Cincinnati had in a circle around the city, Nike uh, anti-aircraft missile batteries that okay. had state-of-the-art radar. So what the Air Force would do is as these bombers would move from air base to air base and fly over Cincinnati, they would pick out certain features of the landscape that had a unique radar signature and they would tell the pilots, you know, as you're going by Cincinnati, pick one of these targets and then signal that you're dropping a, a, a hydrogen bomb. You, you wouldn't, you <laughs> would not actually, actually drop, drop it. it. Just <laughs> yeah, you you would you would just you know go through the motions and push yeah. the button without arming it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the radar in these Nike missile batteries would would record where you drop the bomb and see how accurate you were and you oh, would okay. get graded on it. And years later, the paper actually published a map of this. Here's, here's the route going yeah. through and this way going through. And here are the Nike missile batteries, right? And one of these targets was in Maysville. Ah. So this guy, this guy is claiming to have seen a hovering craft of some sort right. uh, in the field next to his house. The Air Force is trying to tell them it's a conventional military aircraft, and yet they're not allowed to tell them why they think it's a conventional military aircraft, because this whole uh, nuclear bomb practice run was classified right. at the time. Hmm. And the fact is, it might have been, you know, let's let's take this another interpretation and say the aliens were listening to all these clicks on radar and they coming knew. down to say, you could come what, check it out. What are they doing? <laughs> you know, what are these people doing here? Interesting. I mean, okay. I would think if the aliens are smart enough to, they they can they can kind of go back and forth between the. Right. Radars and see what the, just, just watch what the government's doing and be like, all right, we're just going to follow your aircraft. Yeah. See where it's going. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the interesting thing, having gone through all the reports that I could find on Cincinnati mm -hmm. is there are two reports. Uh, it's been, it's been years since I was really into UFO stuff, but when I was in like seventh grade, eighth grade, I read, read a lot of UFO books. Yeah, uh, you, you, UFOs are real, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there are two particular cases in Cincinnati that appear in all of those books. And apparently nobody filed a report with the Air, Air Force on them. One, one of them in, involves this guy. This is this is Ed Moots. Ed, Ed lived on on Bowl Street, which uh -huh. is in the Pendleton neighborhood just just outside over the Rhine yep. in Cincinnati and um, back in 1955 uh, Ed Moots was working in his garden and and uh, something splashed on his hand and he he looked up and there's a cloud and it looked like some kind of aircraft was coming out of the cloud or was hidden inside the the cloud uh -huh. and uh, it's dropping liquid out of the sky. And uh, 
the stuff that landed on his hands started to burn. And so he went inside to wash it off. And when he came out, this, this cloud was still there and there was so much fluid, it created kind of a pool around a peach tree that he had in his, his backyard orchard. Well, it, it eventually killed the tree and it killed all the grass. And he called, uh, called the police. The police called in people from uh, the FBI and that sort of thing. They all came out, took pictures, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's in all the books. Yeah. Uh, but no one seems to have filed a report uh, with uh, the Air Force on it, even though 1955 is right in the middle of this Project Blue Book stuff. Yeah. Another interpretation, again, if you if you want to go down the conspiracy route, maybe they did file a report. Maybe mm -hmm. that one was one the Air Force decided not to. Couldn't couldn't just redact the information, right? And you could still look at the other books and find out exactly where it was. Right. Then we have then we have this one. This is probably the most famous UFO in Cincinnati. This is from yeah. 1949. Now this is actually before before Project Blue Book, so it 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 wouldn't be in there because uh, it wasn't in in action yet. Right. But what this is is after World War II, after World War II, there, there was an incredible amount of army surplus equipment and, and a whole industry grew up about uh, dispersing this army surplus equipment. I remember there was a, a little store off Fountain Square where uh, as a child, I, I would take the bus downtown, go into the store and I, I could buy insignia. I love these army patches, you know, and mm -hmm. they, they'd have patches for almost all the uh, uh, army and air force divisions. And I'd, I'd put them on my jackets to wear to school and stuff like that. You could buy tank periscopes and, and that sort of thing. Oh, and go. one of the things you could buy was searchlights. You know, the searchlights were part of the aerial defense of London and whatever. And you'd have these high powered arc lamps Mm -hmm. with a big reflective mirror that would shoot these huge beams in the sky. Well, back in the, uh, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, anytime you were opening something, opening a car lot, opening a shopping center, opening a movie theater, that sort yeah. of thing, you would rent one of these uh, searchlights and have it out, do, 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 do. And it was the kind of thing where you from your backyard, you'd see the searchlights and think, well, I'm going to go down there and find out what that is. Yeah, kind of like the, the giant Batman symbol. Put yeah. Out the clouds. yeah, exactly. And so in 1949, uh, Saints Peter and Paul Church in Norwood was having a church festival, you know, Cincinnati's big on summer church festivals. And so they, they, they rented one of these uh, searchlights, and they got they got a kid from a local ROTC group uh, to man the searchlight. Mm -hmm. And as he's swinging this thing around, he kept it looked like something's up there. And so he just holds the light steady, and sure enough, there's this spherical object mm. hovering in the sky. Wow! And it was there for weeks. They they, 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 they it wasn't just like it was there one night. Yeah. And disappeared or something. This church festival went on for a couple of days and they just decided to keep the searchlight there because people were showing up and wanting to see this and he'd fire it up there and there'd be something hanging there. Oh. Wow. The, um, they, they apparently did talk to somebody at the Air Force. Uh, they referred them to the National Weather Service. The National Weather Service sent a guy out and he says, well, you know, it appears to be a weather balloon. The problem is uh, I just got the records. Uh, the wind's blowing 30 miles an hour up there right now, and this thing's holding perfectly still. Yeah. And it was not only in Norwood, reports around Cincinnati, uh, Madeira, and uh, over in Terrace Park, people would set up searchlights and they would find things like this hanging in the sky for for a couple of months. Reports wow. were uh, were coming in and never received uh, any any particular uh, interpretation that, that made any sort of sense. And so 
as I said, you know, Project Blue Book, it closed down 1970. But that didn't stop uh, people from continuing to, to make reports. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1978, uh, for instance, there was a flurry of UFO reports in Cincinnati. Every, everything from uh, Forest Park down into uh, the furthest reaches of Boone County, people were making reports in October of, of 1978. And it seems like every four or five years, uh, we get a flurry of UFO reports uh, in this area to this day. Interesting. To this day, even? To this day. Wow. Yeah, of course, of course now they're, uh, uh, they, they track them all on social media. Right. You know? and, and in fact, it's, uh, uh, it has proved very helpful because uh, I, I was driving down the road one day and I saw these weird lights kind of circling around each other and uh, wondered what in the heck am I seeing? And the first thing I did was uh, did a search on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And what it turned out to be was um, parachutists uh, flying into a football game yeah. at UC with flares on their mm -hmm. boots. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I, at the time I was probably, Oh, eight or nine miles is the crow flies from UC, but I could still see them, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, it I mean, was now, because of Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Now we have Twitter and social media that we can, we can check those kinds of things. Or right. like back then, if they were getting like a, a 4k video of yeah. some of those things, the, uh, like the Air Force couldn't just go, eh, insufficient. <laughs> They're exactly. going to have to have a, a little bit better of an explanation for those. Exactly. And I've, I've, done, uh, I've done kind of a talk on this. I did, you know, the UFOs of Western Hills, UFOs of Northern Kentucky, yeah. that sort of thing. And every, every time I give this talk, uh, it's one of the questions from people is, do we have more sightings? Mm-hmm. Now that people are are actually carrying around video cameras and that, right. and the thing is, we really aren't. You know, the, the uh, we're we're there. There have always been a lot of sightings. I, I think that's what people don't understand. They, I think they think sightings in the past were rare. Yeah. The fact that they had twelve thousand reports uh, over eighteen years indicates that they were not rare. Uh, so we're, I don't think we're seeing more. We're getting better quality yeah. is what we're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that, that, uh, that leads us into the question. Um, do you believe in extraterrestrial life and UFOs? Or uh, are you still <laughs> siding with the Air Force that uh, there's not an insufficient evidence to this point? The... Uh... I, I, I tend to uh, I, I tend to rely on on data and evidence, and so right. so I, I I kind of step away from uh, belief, mm -hmm. and and I think the uh, the data that we have uh, really hasn't proven one way or another. Uh, but um, another way to uh, answer the, that question is to say I actually have seen some things that I have no explanation for. There you go. Um, the uh, I, I I grew up in a community called Dent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, it's it's now very populous. At the time I lived there, there there weren't many people there, <laughs> and and uh, uh, the the way I saw this is is uh, uh, you know you live in Dent, you got to develop your own hobbies. My hobby was walking around the streets picking up cigarette butts, and then at <laughs> night climbing out onto my roof and smoking them. Okay. And so, and so I'm, I'm out on the roof smoking a cigarette that I'd picked up off the ground earlier that day. And I see these weird lights in the sky. Yeah. And so, so I went down, woke up my, uh, my parents, they woke up the neighbors. We had the whole yard full of people. And what there was is an array of about 15 lights that were mm -hmm. moving in kind of a random motion. And every once in a while, one of these lights would just zip off incredibly fast in a different direction and then come back in while another one would go off in another way 
the um, the closest thing that I've seen to it is there's a scene in Close Encounters where there's a bunch of people gathered on the curve of a hillside road. Yeah. And they're watching a bunch of lights down in the valley that eventually come flying past them with this little tiny light bringing up the end. And that's what it looked like, you know, and we, we were never able to figure out what it was. Wow. And you were, that was what year? How old were you? I was probably 15, 15 14, okay. 15 at okay. the time. But that was and the, uh, one of the neighbors, uh, uh, I, I saw one of the neighbors recently and she still remembers it. She remembers that. <laughs> That's you know, great. She asked me, did, did anybody ever find out what that thing we saw? Did was? anyone file a report? With... Yeah, no one filed a report. <laughs> wow. On that one. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, the that's that's one that uh, when people say, have you seen a UFO? Yeah, uh, I, I definitely have seen a UFO that it was an unidentified flying object. Have you seen an extraterrestrial spacecraft? I don't know. Don't know. Unexplained I don't know. Explains to you. You don't yeah. know exactly what it was. You, you just have your own recollection of it. Right. Wow. All right. Well, we can leave that one to, to the people of Cincinnati. Now you have, uh, if you are, are going back and forth with whether aliens are real or UFOs are real, now we have some actual uh, Cincinnati evidence that, <laughs> that uh, UFOs have been sighted in the area do you believe or do you not believe the choice is <laughs> the up truth to you. is out there the truth is out there it is up to you thank you again greg hand for joining us go follow him at uh, cincinnati curiosities where he will continue to talk about cincinnati um and probably bring some ufos if any new evidence comes to light <laughs> we can have the air force on here and we can see if uh we can have that guy that that was talking in the uh, in the fifties. See what he he said, and uh, have him go toe to toe with the Air Force and see why they didn't give him enough evidence for that. Uh, but go follow him, um, and we will have you back here on the three AM Coney to unearth more of Cincinnati's bizarre past. Till next time. Yeah.